vehicles blazed by our pioneers have become familiar tracks of commerce and industry, and from this enterprise has grown the largest organization of its kind in the world. Its international jet services link South Africa with many lands, while the internal jets have brought our cities and those of our neighbors to the doorstep of businessmen and other travelers. Its harbors have become the gateway to our modern, prosperous South Africa. The flashing beam of its lighthouses guides mariners to a safe and friendly anchorage. And its road transport services are pioneering new trails beyond the railheads. Yes, we've come a long way. From the southern tip of our continent to our vast northern borders, from the Indian Ocean to the Atlantic, steel rails have bound the people together become the pulsating arteries of a free nation and the framework on which our civilization and prosperity is firmly based. The wealth of our diamonds and gold was the magnet that drew the people and the railways to the hinterland. But other mineral wealth only awaited a rail to carry it to eager markets. Coal, for instance, one of our greatest mineral assets, is refined into petrol and chemicals, transported over vast distances to bring cheap electrical power to our homes and industries. In transporting coal and iron ore for the making of our own steel, the railways are playing a vitally important role. Steel, not only for further railway development and maintenance, but a commodity that has made our rapid industrial expansion possible. With new industries, add up new rail links for hauling the products of our factories, fashioned into the shape of things our people need. The railways pump our fuel oil from the refineries at the coast to the distant inland centers, and also distribute by rail tanker throughout the land. As a modern country, we use a lot of oil, and with increasing demands for more food, agriculture has become a major consumer of petrol and diesel fuel. In feeding a nation, the food must be delivered at a price the people can afford. Maize and wheat, beef from the far-flung cattle ranching areas of the north and beyond, perishables from the coast and inland centers transported in fast refrigerated trains fruits and vegetables from the gardens of our nation. The export of fruit has become a major industry, mainly due to pre-cooling facilities provided by our harbors and the speed of handling. Yes, this is our railway, a service bound to the prosperity and welfare of its people. The steel rails that first brought civilization to the early inland settlers have become the nation's busy highways. The old railway construction camps are now established towns and cities. Keeping the nation's wheels rolling takes a lot of organization. And throughout the country, in offices and workshops, airports and harbors, 200,000 men and women of every racial group, of every walk of life, and a good cross-section of most trades and professions known to man share a common pride in knowing how to serve a nation. Yes, behind the men who run the trains, the airliners and the harbors, there are many men and women playing their part. No man works alone, for each man's work depends on another's work. Our railways handle a lot of goods, the people and the products of a nation so that one man may exchange his goods with another man in the working pattern of a free economy. Once the trucks are loaded, they are pushed up a little man-made hill called the hut. The shunter opens the couplers, and a truck rolls down an easy grade, and is diverted into one of many parallel tracks marked for a particular destination. Where possible, through loads are assembled that allow trains to travel to their final destination without having to be broken up. For every train made up in the yards, a train is made up in the offices too. A hundred different people will know of its existence. 
It will assume an identity of its own. A number 77 down, perhaps. The selector clerks will fit it into a carefully planned timetable. Centralized traffic control will take over and guide it through unmanned stations hundreds of miles away. A railway at their fingertips. As 77 down glides out and onto the main lines, people along its route will expect it. It will be shunted into a loop to allow express trains to pass. It will lose trucks. It will gain trucks. It will change engines and operating crew. But at its destination, it will still be known as 77 down. Traffic on the main lines is always heavy, with hundreds of trains travelling throughout the day and night, with only a few minutes between. In this complex schedule of dense traffic, special trains are fitted in to carry enthusiasts to major sporting events in all parts of the country. Other trains are run on regular conducted tours, where the train becomes an hotel on wheels many tourists visiting our beauty spots. On these tours, cars are provided for the added pleasure of excursions into the backwoods, where the beauty of nature stands untouched by the hand of man. Our country has much to delight the tourist, and apart from the regular train and coach tours, the Railway Travel Bureau provides facilities for individuals or groups where the tours are tailor-made to suit their special requirements. These services, and particularly the all-inclusive tours provided for local and overseas visitors, have done much to bring within the reach of all the many places of interest and rich scenic beauty of our country. comfort of the motor coaches or on a rail tour, the happy, warm and carefree atmosphere on these tours goes on one. For many, the tours are an annual pilgrimage to renew old acquaintances and to make new ones. Behind the men who run the trains, there are many whose constant vigil and preparedness help to keep them running. Some use machines which can see right inside the steel rails, looking for flaws no human eye could ever see. Others must repair rail damage at short notice. Maintenance takes a lot of men, from the man on the spot to the men in the workshops, where the modern concept of maintenance is to locate the trouble and repair it before it happens. A railway is never really built. There's always something new being added to it. Industry is large enough to need a rail connection spring up along our lines. And projects like the Palabora Copper and Phosphate Complex are continually expanding our railway map. The restless activity of our railways never ceases. Research into new techniques for rail construction and maintenance are part of the constant aim for more efficiency. Diesel locomotives are taking over from steam to good effect in Southwest Africa, the Eastern Cape and Transvaal. And the gradual electrification of certain sections of the network is already contributing to better and faster services. The conversion to electricity has added to the industrial frontier created by railway requirements. A new industry builds our locomotives in addition to existing factories turning out trucks, coaches, and the wide range of goods needed to run a railway. A railway needs highly trained men. At 
Nislin Park in the Transvaal, there is an institute which has no counterpart anywhere in the world. It is in effect a railway man's university, where special training keeps the many grades of workers abreast of modern techniques in their particular fields. Further training is provided for white and non-white at the various regional headquarters, which play their part in keeping the railway man at peak efficiency. Who are these people who run our railways? Who keep our wheels rolling? They are plain and friendly people living in the cities, towns and rural districts. Many living in their own homes among our friends. A neighbor whose patronage of the railways gives them the work by which they earn their living. And they in turn contribute to these communities. They buy from merchants up and down the streets of a hundred towns. In smaller towns, one man alone must do many jobs. He advises the shippers and the passengers. He knows more about the railway than anyone in town, and more about the town than anyone else on the railway. He's the man that keeps it humming and who keeps it human. In large cities, it takes many people to do the many jobs. But the human side is just the same. To the passenger, the railway is the commissioner who directs him to the correct platform. The man who issues the tickets. The steward who serves the meals. The porter who checks the baggage. An atmosphere of pioneering enterprise still surrounds some of the railway's operations. The road transport services, for example, link the many railheads and industrial sectors with the faraway places where the frontier spirit still prevails. The service penetrates deep into new and developing areas. It conveys sugar from Pongola to the railhead at Petrotif, cattle in the Freiburg area, fruit in the Prince Alfred Hamlet district. It is equipped with special vehicles that transfer abnormal loads from rail to road. These road services represent a vital advance investment in our future development. Since the early days of Van Riebeck's landing at the Cape, our harbors have grown in number and importance. Today they're amongst the world's most modern, providing facilities for the thousands of ships that visit our shores each year. The teeming activity in our ports is a yardstick of the place we hold among trading nations of the world. We have much that other nations need. Our wool, skins and hides bring buyers from all over Europe and the Far East. The export of sugar has reached such proportions as to justify the bulk loading installation at Durban. Cape Town, Durban and East London are the main harbors for handling bulk shipments of grain. And our iron ore, manganese, and the many other minerals that are in great demand are speedily handled at Port Elizabeth and Durban. These harbors that once served only as stepping stones for trade with the East have become centers of intense trade, catering not only for ships and cargoes, but providing a new degree of luxury and convenience for the visitors to our land. One of the most important items handled by the organization is mail, which must be given top priority and sped on its way. It was in 1934 that our national airline, South African Airways, first came into being. Today, South Africa's airports have become the bustling crossroads for travelers of the world, providing all the amenities of modern air terminals. Everyone, let me start there. Good morning. We have you in sight. The service is a 330 at 16 knots. Near the Tower 231, final 03. Attention, please. South African Airways Boeing 727 from Salisbury has just landed. Our internal jets fly businessmen for a day's work to the far-flung corners of our country and beyond and return them to their families in the evening. Our trans
transcontinental jet airliners have pioneered new routes to Europe, carrying thousands of passengers to faraway places, the names of which have become familiar at our airports. To ensure that the reservations organization functions at maximum efficiency, the latest techniques in communication and data processing are employed. We work in close liaison with other airlines, establishing contact with our neighbors the world over. We prepare meals for other airlines besides our own. This batch will fly with our Boeing to Lisbon, Rome, and Athens. The stewards who serve must be specialists in their field and are trained to perfection. On each occasion, before a jet takes off on an international flight, the crew must first fly the route in a simulator, which simulates all the conditions likely to be encountered on the trip. As our jets wing their way over foreign continents, our radio station ZUR at Jan Smuts keeps them in constant contact. This is one of our Boeings, which has just taken off from Rome and is now heading for Zurich. At 0910, reading you loud and clear for call final Zurich. Modern techniques combined with superb equipment leave nothing to chance in the routine servicing of every aspect of the aircraft. This is the first stage compressor fan being tested at 60,000 revolutions for one of the engines that will propel a jetliner to London and return it home. The world has indeed become a small place. The businessman will meet his London principles in the morning. The happy tourist will awaken to a new world of pleasure and excitement. And the very young, born into this jet age, will for a while remain peacefully oblivious to the wonders of modern air travel. Sleep home. You're in good hands. 